colleagues, uh, my name is Maxim Bashkatov. I'm the research director of the International and Comparative Law Research Center in Moscow. And uh, my guest today is uh, Dr. Oliver Folka from Vienna, the partner of the famous Austrian law firm Stadel Folka. I think one of the most enthusiastic specialists in the sphere of uh, blockchain law and the tech law in general. And uh, today we'll talk about uh, regulation of blockchain in and fintech products in Europe and in Austria in particular. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, in St. Petersburg and uh, I hope that you like it in our session as well. Um, my first question would be the following one. Uh, what do you think about uh, the future perspectives of regulation of blockchain? Because, you know, the main idea which is on hype that Blockchain is something about the law which should be regulated by the state and by the law in general because uh, we used to think that we're the first country which uh, tries to invent some regulation about blockchain and that's our uh, peculiarity and, uh, and our advantage. And uh, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, and also thank you for having me in the forum. It was a, uh, one of the great sessions and uh, incredible speakers and I'm really glad that I'm here and I love the city. It's a beautiful a uh, beautiful place to be. Um, yeah, so the question of regulation. It's always a question how much regulation is necessary or how much regulation do you really want? And the thing is, um, and I'm keeping to, to stress this over and over again, but basically there's no rights-free space or no law-free space. So we do have, generally speaking, regulation. If I um, look to Austrian law or to European law, mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, I mean, it's always the case. When the internet came, uh, was a new thing and came up, also people were struggling to, to, to find uh, the, the laws that apply to it or to um, apply them properly, you know, taking into account the speci specialities of the internet, for example. And I think we're in the same phase now when it comes to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, and what I have seen particularly interesting is um, people do have difficulties understanding the technology. But if you're not understanding the, understanding the technology, you cannot make a, legal <clears throat> a sound legal assessment. So I think the first point would be to educate um, the public, but also the decision makers and the, the regulators, mm -hmm. what blockchain technology actually is, how it works. And if you do that, actually the legal classification follows. So I'm not really a proponent of new regulation. Mm -hmm. I mean particular fields aside, for example, okay. it's a good idea to have know your customer rules for uh, for crypto uh, uh, um, companies. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I'm, I'm not really f uh, in favor of new regulation. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's always, I mean, I heard you talk about um, the proposal or what is being done in Russia uh, okay. now. And I think, um, I mean, I've not looked into this in, in too much depth, but I think it creates problems that perhaps we don't even, you know, don't need to create. Okay, but uh, you compared that with the internet, mm -hmm. but uh, as far as I know, the main idea of internet regulation was to avoid uh, some abuses on the market, but uh, the main idea of blockchain, blockchain products, is based on the pre presumption that uh, the law should be executed uh, without that, and the, 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 there are two separate spheres blockchain and the law we should have and that uh, the law should be avoided from application there to the yeah. blockchain products i mean yeah. i mean that's that's really a uh, philosophical uh, <laughs> question rather but basically i mean do you know any place where no laws apply uh, there are none in okay. my opinion and but, i think we need laws that also apply on the blockchain we do have them okay but uh, if we're talking about that uh, the law should control the enforcement of some rule and some uh, some rule of law, and uh, how to uh, how to enforce that uh, within the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, if uh, we have uh, the award in cryptocurrencies, how could Bailiff uh, enforce it? How can Bailiff? Uh, Go mm. inside the blockchain, take something, some uh, cryptocurrency amount from the account, and to bring it to mm. the uh, yeah. plaintiff. 
I think the answer is not that we cannot have regulation or that uh, when a smart contract, I mean, it's just a program that's executing some uh, rules that you've programmed in before. It's nothing really new. We have that every time we go into a parking space and we uh, push a card and we get a, a receipt for, for entering the garage. And then when we go out, we pay. I mean, that's also a smart contract, you could say. <laughs> um, so it's actually nothing new. So the, the notion we don't need laws for this sector is um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to apply that. Uh, I had a second thought which slipped my mind now, but perhaps uh, uh, it, it comes back when we continue talking. Okay, and um, I will talk cryptocurrencies. What do you think? Uh, is it a separate object of civil rights or we should talk about uh, some new reality which shouldn't be regulated by law? Mm. Uh, for example, uh, in Russia we have several um, court decisions, uh, court judgments uh, about um, uh, cryptocurrencies. For example, in one case the Russian court declined uh, their um, uh, suit uh, aiming to include cryptocurrencies into their uh, uh, property mass which belonged to the plaintiff, uh, to, to the defendant. And uh, in other case, uh, the appellate court uh, confirmed that cryptocurrency is something like uh, property which is not uh, named in the, into the civil code, but some, some sort of property. Mm -hmm. And the law sh should uh, deal with that somehow. And, uh, but so we're the diverging decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. And, uh, but more or less, we really don't think that it should be attributed to money in legal sense. And uh, what do I think should be, should be, uh, is it possible to attribute it to money and how to deal with that? Because uh, money is an uh, object for separate uh, contractual types like loan, monetary obligation, interest, all these categories could be applied only if we treat something like money in legal sense. Okay. And uh, maybe the Arthur Nussbaum's theory about uh, social theory of money should be uh, applied in this case and to help us how to help us to attribute money uh, to, to attribute cryptocurrency mm -hmm. to money or oh. something something like that. Yeah. So I mean, this is also really a very fundamental question. Also, if you're speaking on an international comparative uh, scale. Um, if I look into Austria, um, we have the proposal. I mean, there is also not really a court ruling on that yet, but I think it's rather established that cryptocurrencies or other assets that you put on a crypto uh, on, a, on a blockchain uh, should be treated as things in property law terms. I think uh -huh. this makes it much easier to deal with them properly. Uh -huh. um, and the rationale, I mean, the rationale behind this, I could go into detail about Austrian law, but basically, you need two two aspects um, to, to, to classify something as a thing and apply property laws uh, principles to that. First one should be, it must be different from first and well, that's established. And the second is, um, I'm not going into much detail, it needs to be controllable. And if you look into, if you look into how blockchain technology actually works and what you need to transfer ownership uh, or to transfer assets from one person to another, or to say from one, S, from one address on the blockchain to another address, it's the knowledge of a private key. This mm. comes back to what you said before, how do you enforce uh, mm. a court ruling? And I will get back to that also. Um, and this, um, this particularly strong um, controllability over your assets seems to um, suffice to classify cryptocurrencies and other crypto assets as things and apply property law uh, terms on that. And I mean, in Austria, we could also then go further and say, well, it's a fungible thing and it's not really important uh, which Bitcoin or which Ether or other crypto asset I have as long as I have one of this particular kind. Okay. And this would mean that we could also uh, apply all sorts of contracts to that. For example, also loan agreements, um, sales agreements, pledge agreements. Uh, you could use it as a security. And coming back to this one question before, how do you deal with um, this inenforceability? Mm -hmm. What I think will happen. We are now in an early stage of development and, you know, the general public is still adapting to all of this. And what I think will happen is it's not going to be a technical solution, but again, it's going to be a legal solution. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine a law stating we will accept blockchain technology, we will accept it as uh, a new form of property, but we will only accept as legally allowed such blockchains blockchains okay. that allow for some sort of state super user to make changes. So yeah, like yeah. A, a, a private key state owned where you need a court decision to simply change uh, any values. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Imagine you have a wallet software with 100 bitcoins 
Yeah. <laughs> I hope you, <laughs> I hope you okay. have that. Uh, and uh, somebody steals uh, cryptos from you. Okay. You see where they went. You can possibly it's it's clear as the sky that this was illegally um, approved. Why not simply reverse the transaction? And the idea would be, okay, have a super user, you need a court enforcement to make these changes. This could be a possibility mm -hmm. where this, and this is a legal solution, not a technical solution. I mean, sort of both is, but it's a legal solution stating there is an authority that can still make changes to an otherwise unchangeable system. Yes, I, I understood that. But you know, uh, your suggestion is just to admit only those systems which presupposes something like a supervisor who can reverse the transaction but uh, maybe that's that would be in contradiction with the main idea of blockchain of course it's definitely uh, maybe uh, from that point we should accept not all blockchains but uh, then we should admit that the only remedy which the uh, injured person uh, affected person will get is the losses and the main problem will be just to how to calculate these losses, for example, in the, in the situation of breach of contract mm -hmm. uh, or just enrichment, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the only thing which uh, surprises me from this point, because in the sphere of uh, tokens, cryptocurrencies, etc., is how we shall deal with their uh, object which could be easily trace, traced. Uh, that's uh, from the position of uh, uh, property law. Uh, if you can trace the, pro the, the object, you can uh, recover it. Sure. Uh, yes, yeah, that's, but that's uh, the, yeah, yes, that's, that's our minds. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should, the law should think that uh, all blockchain objects should be treated as fungible, just yes. as a pre just a, a presumption. It, yeah. it is fully fungible, yeah. and that's why we couldn't recover it according to the continental law, and uh, just to recover losses. But you know, it's strange because, uh, you, of course, uh, you can recover losses in nearly in all the cases because that's the basics uh, sure. of every legal system. Sure. If you, you have your rights violated, just get losses, and that's it. Exactly. Uh, maybe that we are just talking about uh, not real. Uh, objects of rights but lie about the system of fixing the rights on something which really exists uh, as shares uh, monetary assets etc because uh, my, my idea is that if blockchain doesn't give us something special in the sphere of remedies mm -hmm. mm, was well, it a common thing maybe we are talking just about some not the way to mm, simplify something but to complicate something yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, more or less. I think I see your point. Uh, I, mean, I, I would have a couple of answers to that. I think the first one is it's really important to distinguish between um, like the first uh, offender, so to speak, the one who steals your cryptos. I mean, I wouldn't see a problem reverting any transaction if you had a super user. For, uh, oh, yes, just, of course, of course. Yes, from this point, um, of course. Then if, uh, it, I mean, it's the same with money. If you then, you uh, if you go, if you get, uh, if thousand rubles are stolen and your thief pays uh, in, uh, in, in, in the shop okay. you wouldn't ever uh, have the idea to me as the as the victim uh, sue the shop owner to revert uh, my my money and I think classifying I mean at least in Austria classifying cryptocurrencies as things solves all of these problems because then we have exactly the right solution if you can get back from the first one if the second uh, uh, but he had acted, has acted so bona fide, then you can't get it back from the second person. Yeah. I mean, that was one answer. The other answer would be, I mean, there are also all other sorts of um, cha or, or ways to um, make some, or to enforce a contract. You could also impose fines if somebody simply doesn't want to uh, uh, divulge the private key, for example, okay. uh, until they do, for example. Um, and also, I think it's really also an important aspect, what I said before, there could be block, uh, a blockchain that allows super users that are state controlled. I think this is very likely this will happen and then we have two sorts of systems. A black system that's not really um, useful in, in the general market with uh, with regular market participants and then sort of the, the, the white market where we use these blockchains that are allowed. And I think people would switch to these okay and that's the first thing and also what I think uh, is really uh, important um, on the European level for example we have uh, an anti-money laundering regulation that has been updated it's the update of the fourth anti-money laundering mm -hmm. regulation which for the first time includes now cryptocurrencies uh -huh. I think it's really important to not only have banks and other financial institutions subject to those uh, um, uh, regulation but also crypto dealers and here again once we have established this 
a KYC regime for crypto uh, exchanges and dealers. There will be some who adhere to this regulation, and then there will be some who don't. And all cryptos that are traded in this uh, sort of um, gray market will not really be able to enter into the white market anymore. So I think my prediction is we will see um, really a, 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 I mean, the technology is here, it's here to stay, that's mm. uh, undisputable. And we will see an emergence of regulated uh, blockchains okay. and um, regulated participants. And I think these are the ones that will uh, last for, for yeah, well, next I'll, years I'll, to come. I'll, I'll like qualified investors, eh? am I right? Um, uh. n well, not, on, not only on investor scale, but really on, on if the uh, fourth money laundering uh, directive tells you as a crypto dealer, you need to know who your who the people are who are purchasing cryptos from you. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Do you know what I mean? Then you yeah, will the, have a division just, between... uh, disclosure, disclosure of yes, exactly. identity. Exactly. Yeah, that's that, that's interesting. But um, what for ICOs? Uh, do we need uh, a special level of fair fair dealing on this level, of good faith standards uh, mm -hmm. in comparison with IPOs, for example? Yes, absolutely. So the thing is, um, I, we, we have seen in Austria a couple of initial coin offerings. Uh, most of them uh, were structured by us and they worked just fine also with the regulator. And um, the thing is, there is law and you need to apply the law. If you structure your ICO in a way that complies with the law, then it's absolutely fine to do so. That's the first answer to that. The second answer would be, Yes, definitely. We need uh, information obligations like we have with regular financial markets transactions. If you're selling a token, you need to be, uh, uh, you, you have to inform your investors or purchasers or whatever you call them about what you're actually selling to them. Okay. And I think the same um, standards should apply to initial coin offerings. Actually, I mean, this, this is also something that many people simply overlook when they are doing an, an ICO in, in uh, oh. Europe. Uh, we do have some sort of regulation at least. Yeah. I mean, you can use the blockchain, for example, to, to issue securities. This mm -hmm. is established. You can use, use the blockchain to issue tokens which do not qualify as securities. Um, but if you are under this regime, there's still the consumer rights directive that applies. And this also stipulates that you have to inform your investors, your purchases, what you're actually selling to them. And I mean, you can stretch, of course, how far these information obligations go. They are not as detailed as you find in the regulation on, on capital markets issuings. So it's rather a short list and undefined terms, but you can sort of do something with it. Um, but definitely there needs to be a separate regulation of what, is need to, what needs to be disclosed uh, when you're doing an initial coin offering. And also, my last point, uh, in Austria there is a regu regulatory committee uh -huh. that has been put in place exactly on that issue because Austria has um, promoted itself to be a place Okay, control of, the entrance. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but what do you think about uh, Buffin approach and mm -hmm. the attempt just to state the limit, uh, the, the limit for the amount which could be used for investment uh, on the ISO market? I think it's uh, up to ten or I think ten thousand euros, and also you should declare that you have one hundred uh, thousand euros somewhere else. So to allow initial coin offerings only to qualified investors, sort of. Uh, for the person who, who really get money. Yeah. Not for the qualified investor, but for example, for me, uh, it would be possible just to invest some sum of money in some ISO project, uh, just if for, to, to a certain amount, and if I declare that that's it's not my uh, last money, you know, yeah. um, is, is it worth? Uh, is this approach can will ha can we solve the problem by the limit? I don't know. I mean, there's a, a similar regulation also in the US when you're selling securities, which are. Uh, registered but I have not undergone a certain other procedure. Um, I don't think that this is really, uh, also, in, also in Austria we have some similar laws with crowdfunding where you are only allowed to then uh, sell to, to people with nominal amounts of not more than 5,000 euros and such. But I don't really, uh, this do, does not really apply to ICOs by the way, this is a separate uh, thing. Um, I don't really see a benefit of that. I think it sort of um, undermines everyone's own ability to make decisions for themselves. Yeah. And why should you be precluded from making an investment if you think it's a good one uh, yeah. purchasing a bit more? I mean, that's I don't really get the idea behind. The rationale is 
foreign to me. Okay. I, you know, I, I think I got the main idea because of, of this um, approach. Because you know, the, you you're investing something into ICO project more or less um, via um, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, yeah but then yeah. Why, why not apply this to all capital market issuing? Yes, that, that's the point. Because you are, uh, as a general, in general, you are using cryptocurrencies, but mm -hmm. to get cryptocurrencies, uh, you need really to do something uh, in exchange of that. You're just mining it. In the general, you're using mining to get cryptocurrencies. And that's not to apply, you know, labor uh, to get this asset. It's something which came to you via uh, electronic program, but not via your uh, health, your um, fight money, your other assets. And that's why you are making your decision to invest much more easily. But this is only uh, currently the case. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, it's it's incredible uh, what project projects actually got funded on which on which basis. I mean, uh, and I think the reason for this is because we had the Ether uh, ICO actually yeah. a couple of years ago, 2014, I think it was, where I don't know what was one Ether worth back then, 30 cents or so, and then it became yeah. like thousand dollars. A, like incredible uh, increase of value, and there was a lot of um, game money in the in the in the system. Simply, and people were simply throwing away money, investing into whatever, ho in the hopes that this would uh, that this would um, happen again. But I think this is no longer the case. Once this initial uh, wealth explosion sort of distributes, okay. I think people will become much more cautious. And yeah. also, I mean, is this really an argument uh, to 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 prevent people who have uh, yeah, gained yeah. a fortune by chance or by accident? To prevent them from investing, I I I don't really see the the use. Yeah, I got it. And you know, in Russia, we do have a suggestion just to permit uh, ICOs only to a certain amount, of course, from the investor, and uh, only on the separate platforms. Separate platforms, uh, governmentally run uh, and uh, with a supervisor, and only from the separate accounts on this platform uh, with a. Um, Identity reveal uh, disclosed and uh, yes and what do you think is it worth uh, to, um, whether it is efficient or we should well just uh, to organize it like you know crowdfunding in the end and a lot of uh, internet platforms uh, but just to control it uh, post factum via remedies which could be enforced by governmental courts or uh, that should be the control and the entrance via special platform special accounts special supervisor yeah I mean this is also really again you can put this to to the very basic level of would you rather let the market decide which uh, ent or which which way to conduct cryptocurrency uh, to conduct ICOs establishes itself to be uh, a, a suitable one, or do you want to uh, impose some rules that you know um, yeah restrict everything and, uh -huh. and perhaps prevent um, new technologies from emerging? I don't know. I think what it generally the market can decide on many things, and uh, a suitable means of conducting ICOs will emerge. I mean, they do already. Um, but I think um, since it's still so easy to do an ICO, I mean, the thing, what do you need? You need a website, you need a, a couple of faces on a page, a good idea, uh, and you need, to be the connect, uh, you, you need to be connected to the, to the community, basically, and you can raise money. And, and since this is so easy, I think um, some protective measures are necessary, absolutely. One of them is, them is identifying who your investors are, uh, information obligations for the investors to know what they are actually investing in, um, and yeah, but also, and I really need to stress this, the technology itself, blockchain technology and token issuing can be used for capital markets issuing, you, in, issuing. So you can issue bonds, um, you can issue uh, uh, certificates, all sorts of um, financial instruments, you simply use the technology for that, and then we have a regime that's already in place, and then we have this new means of, uh, of funding by issuing tokens that are then used for some purpose. And um, I think for this regime, this oh. new one, we need perhaps uh, stricter information obligations. That's okay. that's my point. Yeah, uh, I will, I fully agree with you. Um, then smart contracts. Uh, what do you think? Whether they have a special legal process, legal nature, or we're talking just about the automatization of the contracts in a general civil law sense. I really hate this term, and, and I'm pretty sure that a technician came up with it, because a, an, a contract is generally speaking an agreement between two people about certain thing, sale, 
friend, whatever. Um, using the a tech, and, and also this term is really technology neutral. You can we can have an oral agreement or we can put it on paper. Why and 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 then comes this programmability in, into play. Where, yeah. What smart contracts actually are? Actually, they are nothing more than a computer program that is running uh, simultaneously or is being executed simultaneously by all. Uh, nodes in in a certain blockchain network mm -hmm. and this is just a technology and i mean what i propose is okay we can agree to have this code this program code to be uh, our contract basis but then uh, all that we have agreed on is a new language so to speak uh, in which we write our contracts yeah um, i mean that's absolutely fine by me and i think this is also con 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 coherent with uh, current laws at least the austrian law i have not seen anything that would dispute this so we could agree on a programming language to be our language that we uh, subject us to uh, our contract language but again we need to distinguish the technology from the legal layer above it yeah but uh, what for rescission and invalidity of such a contract because uh, as a result of invalidity or voluntary rescission yeah. uh, the person who acts in good faith, of course, has, should have the right to recover which was, yes. uh, of the asset which was transferred. That's exactly why we need this layer on top. Ah, okay. That's that's why I mean, if you have a, I mean, you can have a program error or some bona fide mail placement of assets, whatever, where you need to have ability to recover those assets. And um, how you recover that is an, a different question, but I think we need technology layer here we have the execution of, of the terms okay. of the contract and on top of that we have our legal layer and again it's nothing else than if you what you're what we're actually doing all day when we are uh, driving in a garage for our cars where we're yes, nothing but, more actually, uh, but so in my well, opinion yes of course but for example uh, in Russian legal discourse there's a main idea that uh, the using of blockchain for entering into the contract gives you the very good very good benefit uh, the avoidance of any rescission and uh, in this case of invalidity of the contract because you cannot move on move, uh, you can kind of change the blockchain uh, this contract is is inside blockchain blockchain is in the blood of this contract so that's uh, that's it and if you want to recover it via blockchain you should change all the blocks of information that's impossible so that's great we're happy we do, do have the contract without the, invalid, the invalidity yeah, risk this, this, this leads to all sorts of problems uh, remember when uh, ethereum had this main uh, with the DAO or yeah, this, yeah. this major yeah, hack hard occurred hard, yeah, yeah, yeah. where hard incredible form. sums of Ethereum were uh, sto got stolen. And yeah. what had what happened? They simply forked the chain where they yes. reverted it. And I think this is a sign that we actually need a mechanism to make changes also to the blockchain. They need to be applied really carefully and you need court approval or uh, an enforcement procedure that is subject to the court um, overview. Um, but uh, otherwise, we, we run into all sorts of problems. P perhaps we have 20 uh, yeah. forks, hard forks of yes. the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah. Is there any or court practice in Germany or in Austria concerning such a things? Concerning the rescission of smart contracts? No, absolutely no, no. nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. nothing <laughs> Great. Whatsoever. You know, we now have a, well, the suggestion just to uh, regulate smart contracts into the civil code, like. The sort of you know conditional obligation like uh, obligation with a bidding in the German language. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Is it can we say that it's something like a, a conditional obligation or not? Uh, I mean, it really depends on what the smart contract actually tells you. I mean, uh, if you put conditions in there, then probably these yeah, are exactly. conditional yeah. obligations. But it really depends on the content. Um, I yeah. mean, would you would you say that simply because we agree uh, to I agree to sell you a bitcoin for one euro so that from some point of view it should be a condition <laughs> <laughs> I give you bitcoin and you will give me some asset that's a condition but of course that's not the condition in the legal sense in the dogmatic sense of course of course no but I mean then we have our agreement one bitcoin against one euro and then what would I do I would execute our agreement simply by transferring the asset on the blockchain to you yeah. to a new address that's controlled by you, where you have the private key to. Uh, and I think this shows that we need to separate these two layers of technology and, 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 and the contract sense. Otherwise we get into, this is, um, I think this, uh, I mean, we can think about this and perhaps it has some, some positive 
uh, sides to it. But I think we would, since it's so new, we would um, we would run into all sorts of problems and look into look at how long it needed or how long the law needed to develop. I mean, uh, for th over thousands of years, basically. And now we want to, um, you know, turn everything over that we have established simply because there's new technology that we can deal with with the current legal uh, 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 regulation, anyways. So I'm not really a proponent of that. Yes. But I know you're. You're. It's a great experiment that you're. <laughs> I mean, perhaps you'll, exp you'll be the ones who are exporting uh, this oh, idea in the future. I hope they will do that without some sandbox, <laughs> yeah. more or less. And my last question would be about um, registers. Uh, registers based on blockchain because that's uh, you know another application of this technology. Because uh, well, where do we in the idea of that we can solve the problem of public credibility principle using blockchain? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's uh, unreversible. <laughs> what do you think about that? So, for example, for a uh, for okay, uh, for for uh, security for land register uh, or land, securities land, 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 land register, land um, register and, and such, and, and company register yeah. and such. Um, I mean, you know, the basic idea or, or one of the principles or the the, the um, ideas behind blockchain was okay. We want to get rid of a third party that we do not really entirely trust or that we think we we do not need any longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, I'm, I'm, I don't know how it works in Russia. In Austria, we have a centralized uh, land register, for example, and yeah. a centralized yeah. companies register. We also do that. Too. Yeah, of course. Then I, I, why would you need a blockchain? I mean, if you have a third party that you can trust and where you don't run into the issue, what happens uh, if we have a transfer that uh, was made by mistake? Um, I, but I admit it's certainly um, um, applicability or a chance to, to use it for any countries in the United States there's no central register for property uh, uh, land register there yeah, would yeah, make yeah. sense to establish it for example but it's also a very <laughs> philosophical question again but what would but you no but not for Russia because you know in Russia we do have a centralized register but uh, I cannot say that we, tr we trust it enough because we have a lot of abuses and you know uh, unauthorized changes in this uh, register, so that's why we are really thinking that blockchain can solve the problem. Okay. Without uh, the governmental official, we could be corrupted. We can yes. solve that somehow, and to well, to fix uh, the uh, right belonging belonging to the certain person. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you very much for this conversation. It was really great to know that uh, really blockchain is not something uh, unknown and uh, really new for a, a, like an alien product. Uh, I really hope that uh, a Russian way wouldn't be something like curious and funny, but we will find the decision would, would be well funded or well grounded. Yeah, I'm looking. For forward to follow all the developments. <laughs> well, th th thank you very much for coming.